Moscow orders all members of the controversial Wagner paramilitary group to pledge allegiance to Russia. One of Italy's most flamboyant political figures and former Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi dies aged 86. Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shuigu has ordered all volunteers and members of the Wagner Group to sign a contract with the ministry in an attempt to take direct control of the paramilitary group. The privately run Wagner Group has played a major role in the war in Ukraine but also has a significant presence in other countries. On Monday, Russia published images of Chechen Special Forces Ahmad signing the agreement, angering Wagner leader Yevgeny Prigozhin, who's pledged to boycott the contracts. ЧВК Вагнер органично встроена в общую систему. ЧВК Вагнер согласует свои действия с генералами справа, слева, с командирами подразделений, имеет глубочайший опыт и является высоко эффективной структурой. К сожалению, такой эффективности большинство воинских частей не обладает. И именно из-за того, что Шойгу не может нормально управлять воинскими формированиями. It comes as Russian troops are reported to be suffering from low morale and shortages of ammunition. Meanwhile, arguments have broken out between military bosses and Wagner, which has fielded tens of thousands of mercenaries in the battle for Bakhmut. Ten thousand soldiers from 25 countries have begun NATO air defense maneuvers in Wunsdorf, central Germany. Far from a routine drill, it boasts 250 planes and is the largest ever exercise involving troops from the US-led alliance. This against the backdrop of rising tensions with Russia over its invasion of Ukraine. Die Übung ähm, ist ein Signal, ein Signal an uns vor allen Dingen, ein Signal an uns, an die NATO-Nationen, aber auch an unsere Bevölkerung, dass wir in der Lage sind, sehr schnell zu reagieren. Wir haben es jetzt geschafft, innerhalb weniger Tagen 250 Flugzeuge einsatzbereit zu haben, dass wir eben in der Lage wären, das Bündnis zu verteidigen im Falle eines Angriffs. The Wunsdorf Air Base will serve as a control centre, carefully coordinating some 2,000 flights over 10 days to mark the red lines of NATO's Eastern Front. Italy's controversial billionaire media mogul, businessman and former Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi has died at the age of 86. He was readmitted to hospital last week for a checkup after treatment for a lung infection linked to a form of leukaemia. Plagued by scandal, the larger-than-life character who once compared himself to Jesus was Italy's longest-serving premier and dominated public life for decades. Silvio Berlusconi was soprattutto a combatant. He was a man who had never had any fear to defend his beliefs. And it was exactly that courage, that courage, that determination to make him one of the most influential men in the history of Italy a consentirgli di imprimere delle vere e proprie svolte nel mondo della politica, della comunicazione, nel mondo dell'impresa. Outside the Milan hospital where he died, people have been paying tribute to the flamboyant political figure. Despite remaining president of his Forza Italia party, a junior partner in Maloney's coalition, he had largely retired from public view in recent months. For many Italians, including those outside the political arena, the news of the death of Silvio Berlusconi marks the end of an era. Uh, nobody, in fact, in recent Italian history has managed to leave such a significant mark on both Italian and international politics and on Italian culture. Berlusconi has been in the spotlight for many years. And let's remind ourselves of the fact that the full-time Prime Minister also created Italy's largest media company. Despite all the scandals, both financial and sexual, Berlusconi remained in power for many years. And in fact, a political analysts highlight the fact that one of the most remarkable things about Berlusconi was that he was able to inspire trust in many people. Um, according to the latest reports, Berlusconi's state funerals will be held this Wednesday in Milan, the city where he was born, differently from what early reports had suggested, saying that state funerals would be held in Rome.
Giorgio Orlandi for Euronews in Rome. A new clampdown on tourism rental businesses has triggered a heated debate in Italy. The proposed law aims to address the lack of affordable housing and help repopulate major cities. The nationwide bill, which attempts to regulate the market by targeting all types of short-term lets, from Airbnb to villas, is also creating a deep divide among business categories. Hotel owners, in fact, demand more fairness and for the same rules to apply to all facilities. A two-night minimum stay requirement and a new type of identification for property listings are some of the main measures included in the decree. Oggi a Roma ci sono più di 25.000 alloggi, è come se ci fossero 10.000 alberghi. Allora, se io voglio aprire un albergo devo chiedere mille permessi, ma qualcuno può aprire 10.000 alberghi senza dire nulla a nessuno. Quindi più potere ai sindaci, più controlli e più sanzioni, sanzioni efficaci. Ma i propri managers sono determinati a difendere il loro business. Andrea, who looks after 15 apartments in central Rome, thinks the hotels and short-term lets are not comparable. Sicuramente il viaggiatore che sceglie l'appartamento è diverso dal viaggiatore che sceglie l'albergo. No? Non sempre viene fatta una scelta solo economica o solo di cosa, ma viene, spesso viene, fatto, viene scelta l'appartamento la, perché può avere delle caratteristiche specifiche che possono essere apprezzate o anche da un viaggiatore che ha delle necessità diverse. Vedi, noi abbiamo degli appartamenti vicino agli ospedali e quelli, quegli appartamenti sono scelti da persone che devono affrontare una spesa che magari non, non era prevista e, e quindi poter mangiare a casa può essere utile. Everyone though seems to agree on one aspect, that businesses operating illegally should be fined. Siamo favorevoli alle sanzioni per chi non si adegua, siamo favorevoli a un livello di controllo gestito direttamente dal Ministero del Turismo e non da 20 normative regionali. With tourism accounting for a large chunk of the Italian economy, the bill is set to have a large impact on one of the largest markets in the world for short-term lets, although it's still a long way before the proposed bill becomes law. Giorgio Orlandi for Euronews in Rome. The scene of a tragic bus accident in Australia. The incident took place on Sunday night in the popular Hunter Valley wine region, some 180 kilometers north of Sydney. Ten wedding guests died and the 25 other passengers were injured when the bus they were traveling in overturned at the roundabout in dense fog. While the cause of the accident is yet to be determined, the driver of the bus has been charged with 10 counts of dangerous driving and is due to appear in court on Tuesday. One of the two people airlifted to Sydney following the crash remains in a critical condition. Swiss banking giant UBS has completed the emergency takeover of its troubled rival Credit Suisse in the biggest banking deal since the 2008 global financial crisis. The deal announced in March was orchestrated by regulators in a bid to stave off further market turmoil in the global banking system. The group will now oversee more than 4.6 trillion euros of assets. The merger also brings to an end Credit Suisse's 167-year history, marred in recent years by scandals and losses. A letter belonging to the assassin of French scientist and revolutionary Jean-Paul Marat in 1793 has been sold at auction in Versailles for 215,000 euros. The document, which was found on the killer Charlotte Corday, is believed to have been written one day before the murder. In it, she denounces Marat as the vilest of villains. 24-year-old Corday was arrested and executed by guillotine just days later in Paris. The document will be housed in the Normandy Department of Heritage and Culture. This time next year, these secondary school goers won't just use their pens for exams, but also for voting. In the 2024 European elections, Belgium and Germany join Austria, Greece and Malta in allowing 16-year-olds to vote. Pupils here are informed and motivated. Yes, I think it's a good idea because we are all Enfin, c'est nous qui allons devenir adultes dans pas longtemps et c'est nous qui devons nous occuper des choses bientôt. Donc autant qu'on donne aussi notre avis nous. I think it's a really good idea because it means that we can actually um, change what we want to change and so the matters that we find important, we can actually have a voice and so vote for parties or people that we think would carry these um, values. So for example, in our class, ch climate change is quite important or women's rights and so people can actually use their voice to further these ideas. Lowering the voting age means that 270,000 young people in Belgium 
will be able to cast their ballot. The goal of many youth organisations here for years. A change they want to see all over the continent. Young people should be heard and not just seen, they argue. It's true that some young people think that their voices and their votes don't matter. And that's why we need a bigger political change. Voting at 16 is a part of that change. It's one step to getting there. But we recognise we need some more radical changes if we need young people to feel truly engaged in our democracies. That means having more young people in political parties, having more young people in positions of political power, and having young people's opinions taken seriously in our politics. But the big question now, will young people get registered for these elections and take time out to go to vote, even in countries like Belgium, where voting is mandatory? Previous EU elections show voter turnout among youth is dismally low. The goal now is to change this tendency. And of course, for us, the institution, the parliament, but maybe this should be even bigger than just the parliament, this is uh, a priority for many reasons. And maybe the first reason is that these are probably the elections that are more clearly shaping future for these new generations. Uh, because at the end of the day, what will happen at the European level will probably have a bigger and a longer impact than national decisions, uh, let's say, year by year or in the short term. Back in 2019, only 42% of first-time voters actually voted. And only time will tell if they're motivated next year. All eyes on politicians to see how they flirt with this generation. Maeve McMahon, Euronews, Brussels.